Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those I haven't had a chance to, I met most of you. Uh, for those I haven't had a chance to meet, uh, I'm Subra Suresh, uh, the ninth president of uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And I have to say, in uh, the time that I spent in Washington at the National Science Foundation, I didn't have the opportunity to have an event in a room like this. Uh, <laughs> Now, as a, as a private citizen outside the government, uh, we are really grateful to Senator Bob Casey uh, and his staff uh, for uh, helping us uh, um, with the suggestions on uh, th this event. Um, I'll be very brief. Um, we have a wonderful panel this afternoon. The theme of the meeting, uh, usually we talk about uh, the role of innovation as a catalyst for economic development, the role of innovation um, for defense, the role of innovation um, for technological um, advance of the society. Uh, oftentimes, we overlook the fact that universities and educational institutions play a critical role, not only in economic advancement, but transforming their local communities. And uh, Pittsburgh is uh, one of the things that I found very appealing uh, about moving to Pittsburgh was the role that universities such as Carnegie Mellon and University of Pittsburgh play in the economic transformation of the region. And we are not here just to talk about Pittsburgh today, but we are, talk about, we are here to talk about what happened with Pittsburgh as a model and how that can potentially be used in other parts of the country, perhaps other parts of the world, uh, educational institutions as being engines of regional transformation, economic transformation. When we talk about federal support for research, that's what fuels most of this. In fact, when Vannevar Bush in the 1940s wrote his famous uh, report to the US government, on Science the Endless Frontier, which was accepted by President Hoover and led to the creation of the National Science Foundation, he had many things he said in that report that resonated with the White House at that time. But he also said something which was very controversial, perhaps revolutionary at that time. He argued that it's the role of the federal government to support innovation at educational institutions that formed the basis for economic transformation of society. And we know today that that, that statement, that thesis that Vannevar Bush had, how true that is, and Pittsburgh is a very good example of this. There are a lot of things that I can talk about, but I will just mention two or three um, aspects of this transformation. When I first moved to Pittsburgh, I learned that CMU has spun out more companies per dollar of federal research money spent than pretty much every university in the country in the last few years. That combined with the fact that it's been one of the top five institutions in terms of attracting venture capital funding, and it was the only university in the top five that was not located on either coast. The third piece of news that I, I'm happy to share with you is that this year, the faculty at CMU, just the faculty, I'm even setting aside postdocs and students and researchers who are not faculty, will create 36 companies, of which something on the order of 25 to 30 will stay in Pittsburgh. So there are three examples in the first panel that will be chaired by Lenore, Professor Lenore Bloom, who has played a pivotal role in uh, entrepreneurship at CMU for ma in, in many different roles, most recently as the co-director of Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. There are three gentlemen sitting to her right. Politico ran a story a couple of months ago talking about the transformation of Pittsburgh and the role of robotics in the transformation and that article singled out Red Whitaker as one of the key players in the transformation. Sitting to Red's right is Andrew Moore, who's the Vice President of Engineering at Google, 
Andrew, of course, spent many years as a faculty member in computer science, in the School of Computer Science at CMU. In 2006, he left CMU to join um, uh, Google. I think he was employee number one or employee number two. There were two employees. Today, there are 450 employees, half of whom are Carnegie Mellon graduates. And when Eric Schmidt came to CMU campus last November, he pointed out, both privately and publicly, the role that Google Pittsburgh has played for all of Google around the world, and CMU has played for Google Pittsburgh. And uh, so Andrew is a very different example than Red in the transformation of Pittsburgh through technology, innovation, through higher education, and a research university. Sitting to Andrew's right is Jay Whitaker, unrelated to Red Whitaker, uh, spelt with a different spelling, who's a, an associate professor in material science and engineering, who um, uh, started a company that manufactures batteries outside of Pittsburgh, has about 100 employees, has venture capital funding from VCs in California, uh, places like Palo Alto and Silicon Valley, um, with a reach now that's global. So these three people offer examples of the role of higher education. The second panel to my left is um, uh, led by Luke Skirman, who came from California to Pittsburgh to get a degree at Carnegie Mellon, has been an entrepreneur, and has stayed in Pittsburgh. He's a, also a trustee of uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And he has founded a company called Niche, and he's a serial entrepreneur engaging on a global scale. And we also, to his left, is Nish Acharya, who's from the Center for American Progress, who will talk about the role of higher education institutions um, in the transformation of cities and regions. And to his left um, is Dr. Abraham from Youngstown University, um, who will talk about other examples in the Pittsburgh model and, and its implications in the, in the second panel. When we look at all of this transformation going from, um, wh while other major cities who had a similar fate to Pittsburgh had stumbled, why did one particular city, which went through all the negative consequences of the decline of, an in of industry, uh, survive? And, and what led to the transformation. I think uh, this will be an interesting topic for this afternoon. We will be joined later on by Senator Bob Casey, whom I just met before coming here. There is a vote going on on the Senate floor this afternoon, and also by Congressman Mike Doyle. And uh, there'll be opportunities for Q&A with, uh, with the friends and alumni who have joined us. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all my colleagues from Pittsburgh uh, who have played a role in, in organizing this event. I see several deans, uh, the dean of the School of Computer Science, uh, Randy Bryant, this, the dean of the Heinz College, uh, Ramaya Krishnan, um, and also the director or the head of our Software Engineering Institute, Paul Nielsen and many of his colleagues, and there are others, uh, uh, students, that I'm, I'm told there are four robots uh, uh, that are physically here, and there are others that are here remotely uh, uh, that, that you, can, uh, you can observe at the, at the end of the day. So with that, I'm going to pass the podium uh, to uh, Dr. Um, Katz, uh, Bruce Katz, who's the vice president and the founding director of the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institution, and he's going to talk to us about, uh, he's going to challenge you with questions uh, about um, the role of higher education for transforming regions, but he will also uh, tell us about his own unique vantage point because he has given more thought to this than most of us. So, Bruce. Well, th thank you, Mr. President, and uh, pleasure bef uh, to be here before CMU faculty, alumni, um, you really are at the heart of a remarkable transformation 
of an American city and metropolis. I think Pittsburgh is the STEM city and the STEM metro in the United States. I think that's well understood in this country, increasingly understood across the world. What I want to do is just give you a context for today's conversation. And let's just start with the economic context. Um, we are still coming out of this recession. Uh, and at a national level, we need to grow about 7.4 million jobs to make up jobs we lost during the downturn, but to keep pace with population growth and labor dynamics. The United States, unlike Europe, unlike China, unlike Japan, keeps growing 25 or 30 million people a decade. We also have to create better jobs, and particularly in the STEM-oriented sectors, uh, because of the growth in poverty and near poverty uh, over the last decade. It's so really a quantum leap from 81 million in 2000 to 107 million people in 2011. What that requires us is to shift our growth model in the United States from an economy that was really characterized by consumption and debt and a lot of financial mischief to the economy that you've built in Pittsburgh. One that is fueled by innovation, idea generation, production, powered by advanced energy, the shale gas revolution, uh, driven by exports and global engagement and foreign direct investment. You essentially have invented the model, not just for regional transformation, but for a national transformation. So what's the role of research universities in that? Um, the first role, absolutely critical, is you drive national competitiveness. And you do that, obviously, by educating our STEM workforce, STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. It's a substantial portion of the American economy. It is why we are still so economically powerful. But then you do what the president talked about, the basic science, right? Um, the universities and colleges in this country, really powered by federal government investment in NIH, in NSF, in DARPA, really across the board, ARPA-E, um, are the platform for innovative growth and the commercialization of products and services that basically uh, fuel market growth here and around the world. The second piece the research universities do um, is they power regional economies. They're, they are central to regional ecosystems. Let's just take a quick look at Pittsburgh. Uh, you're the 21st largest metro in the United States, 2.3 million people, 31st in economic output. You've been performing well, particularly on output growth uh, since the beginning of, of the recession. So why is that? Because of your universities, right? Because of what you talked about. You, Pitt, Carnegie Mellon, large employment base, but substantial research base and basic science. And off of that, uh, commercialization uh, into key sectors of the economy, whether it's around life sciences, whether it's around computation, whether it's around robotics. Um, leading to that are some very significant innovation numbers, whether it's around STEM jobs, whether it's around patents. Um, and, and again, when we talk about the STEM economy, we're not just talking about people getting doctorates at Carnegie Mellon. A good portion of the STEM economy can be filled by people getting sub-baccalaureate degrees, whether they're out of high school, whether they're out of specialized community colleges. So it gets back to, the, uh, to that super challenge, create more jobs and create better jobs for a large portion of our citizenry. Um, and then what you're seeing, and in there, I saw there was a report out there from Innovation Works on the tech economy in Pittsburgh, substantial growth in the tech economy. I mean, across all sectors, with venture capital coming from all parts of the United States. Last bit, this is really important. The spatial geography of innovation is changing in the United States. If you wanted to find the innovative economy 20 years ago, 10 years ago, you would get in your car in a downtown and just start driving out until you hit a science park somewhere. And then you would go into a campus that was closed and secretive because that's how ideas were generated. The new innovation geography is in the cores of cities or some suburbs where our anchor institutions are located. So look at Pittsburgh. Of the entire Pittsburgh metro, only 1% of the land mass, 13% of the residents, a quarter of the jobs. Why is Pittsburgh powerful? Because of Oakland. The Oakland neighborhood 
It's one of the most innovative campuses, communities, in the entire world, right? A very small portion of the land mass of the city, large portion of residents, very large portion of jobs. Um, so what are the assets of Oakland? Well, UPIT, UPMC, Carnegie Mellon, but look what's going on around this campus. Google's in Bakery Square, Aquian Energy, very close. I mean, Pittsburgh is a very dense metro. You can move around Pittsburgh very, very fast, whether it's by car, whether it's by biking, whether it's by transit, whether it's by bus, right? So what you've created really in Pittsburgh is the new spatial geography of innovation because talented workers want to be in places where you can live, walk, play, and firms want to be close to other firms and anchor institutions where ideas can be shared uh, and commercialized for the marketplace. So I know there are representatives of some of these companies here and some of these other intermediaries, but this is a remarkable transformation. And if any place is basically designed for the 21st century economy, ironically, right, it is Pittsburgh, given what its economy was 50 or 60 or 70 years ago, because of the proximity, because of the density of your universities and your companies in these places. Last piece, um, we're in Washington, so we might as well talk about what the challenge is uh, for our national government. Um, just to start with a challenge, we're moving from a traditional R&D infrastructure um, that was all outside most of these cities. Uh, those, everything happened within the four walls of the Bell Labs or some other R&D center. And the, the, and the lines between basic and applied research were very sharp, were very distinct. All that's over. Right? I mean, we're in a completely new world. So what do we new, need from our national government? What we need is a consistent support for research and development across all these different agencies because that's what makes the United States such a competitive and powerful um, economy. When we think of so many of the technological advancements in this country, they came off that base of university research and places like Carnegie Mellon have just gotten so good at the commercialization. Second, we want to align regional innovation um, clusters with these universities and with this research because the U.S. is a differentiated economy. What Pittsburgh is really good at, it's very different from Phoenix, very different from Portland, Oregon. So how do we get better at differentiating? Um, and there are some really very helpful uh, efforts at the federal level that can be scaled up. And last is this issue of co-location. Density, proximity, the mashup of universities, entrepreneurial companies, a large private sector R&D, and quality built environment, right? So you've got it. Um, the regional transformation of Pittsburgh is not just an interesting case study uh, that you know, we can look at and say, well, that's just different. You are almost a blueprint for what many other cities uh, and metros in the United States uh, can do to power themselves forward and then ultimately uh, power the United States forward. Uh, with that, Lenore, uh, the stage is yours. Okay, um, so what I'd like to talk about, uh, the Pittsburgh recipe, but in particular what we do at um, the university and bridging the gap between university research, uh, innovation, and um, economy stimulating commercialization for the benefit of our communities. And so, as we've all said, um, Pittsburgh, um, we view Pittsburgh as really a model for regions across the country that are reinventing themselves. Um, and this has been noted by many, many people. Here is an article and actually a video of the uh, Financial Times a couple years ago, uh, uh, Kaufman Foundation, and more recently here in, in DC, Politico has, has touted Pittsburgh. Um, and as you heard, um, Innovation Works, Ernst & Young has just come out with a report really pointing to Pittsburgh's universities as the catalyst for innovation. The universities are both providing um, a flow of new technology and also highly skilled talent. And indeed, in the past five years, the amount of uh, research dollars or funding dollars for our early stage company has increased by about 100%, over 100%. And Pittsburgh ranks third now after Boston and Austin in terms of the number of venture deals per capita compared to cities of similar regions. 
Um, at Carnegie Mellon, I think we can argue that we're one of the most interdisciplinary universities on the planet. We're collaborative, we're innovative, and we're can-do culture. So let me tell you what we're doing in terms of innovation. Two years ago, our board of trustees mandated the formation of the Carnegie Mellon University Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. I know that's a mouthful, but it really says what we are. This formed uh, from a partnership between Project Olympus, which, was an in, which is an innovation center starting in the School of Computer Science, and the Don Jones Center for Entrepreneurship in the Business School. So it really is literally a business technology partnership. But our view is very comprehensive and multifaceted. So our center operates across all schools, colleges, and research units. In fact, we're governed by a council of deans. Two of my uh, board are right here in the audience. And the deans have uh, all picked uh, faculty liaisons. So we have on our team faculty members from all colleges across campus, from engineering, uh, business, science, fine arts, public policy and humanity. So we're really very, very broad-based. We also work with, as a commercial arm for many of the research units on campus. Um, so what I'd like to do is give you a little flavor of the kind of things we do. It's a balance between academic and experiential learning. At Olympus, we have a proof of concept incubator. And at the core of Olympus's operations are our probes, our project-oriented business explorations where students and faculty explore the commercial potential of their cutting edge research and innovations. And here, explore is the operative word. In fact, whenever I talk to investors, I say, whatever you've thought of as early stage, we're earlier than that. We're not looking at companies, we're just looking at commercial explorations. And so what we provide for our projects are all the great things, microgrants, space, equipment, advice, education, assistance, mentors, networks, connections, contacts, and visibility. We have an entrepreneur in residence who works with all, all of our students. And even though we've been working at early stage, we've been fairly successful, even by any business metric, in forming companies. Uh, we've worked with over 150 projects since we started Olympus in 2007, and we have about 100 companies coming out and that have received over $90 million in follow-on funding that's irrespective of acquisitions. And indeed, half of the Carnegie Mellon uh, companies in the past three years have come through Project Olympus. So in addition to being broad and uh, multifaceted, we also take a pipeline, a deep approach. So we have pride programs for undergraduates, our Innovation Scholars Program, programs for graduate students and postdocs, that's our Innovation Fellows Program, and we started two years ago an investment fund for companies of recent, recent graduates. Um, I think we've funded so far 25 such companies. Uh, with a 50K uh, convertible note, with a 50K matching. I think 10 will come out in the next 10 weeks. You'll hear about, or actually 10 days, you'll hear about about 10 more. Um, we have some students here who've come through the process. You'll be able to see them in the demos. I see some of them over there. So after uh, these talks, you can go around and see some of the students who've come through the program. In addition to these programs, they're very important is to showcase uh, competitions, connections. We connect, we have many events, targeted events, where we connect business and technology students, our students with uh, business people and investors in the community, faculty with business and people in the community. We work very closely with the University of Pittsburgh Law School, where the law students who are interested in the innovation economy work with our students. And we have very, very many um, show and tell. So as I said, if you're here, if you're in Pittsburgh on Thursday in McConomy at 4.30, we're going to have our 18th uh, Project Olympus show and tell, where we actually, it's a kind of a vaudeville event. We showcase some very quickly, some, um, some research coming out of the university, some of our alum companies, some of our students and tech winners. And then we'll end with uh, outside perspective. This time we have Dan Gilman, who is our council person and also a Carnegie Mellon alum, talking about the, the role of the university in the regional economy. So we're really excited about that. 
as well. So with that, without further ado, I am going to leave it to um, my colleagues who are actually uh, bridging the gap between university research and regional commercialization. Thank you. It's a real honor to be here. I, I really appreciate uh, the introduction, Lenore. And um, I guess I, I can just second that the, the, it's, it's a fascinating thing to hear people talk about this and then to come here and say that I've lived through it. Uh, seven years ago when I moved from California to Pittsburgh, and you, I had no inkling. If you had told me that at that point, that six years hence, I would you know, be a key part, uh, I, something out of my lab will have spun out of Carnegie Mellon, uh, will have 140 plus employees, will have raised over $100 million in, in funding, uh, and will be creating a product that's manufactured and is being shipped to customers. Uh, if you told me this at the time, I would have said, there's no possible way. This is not possible. Uh, I was just starting out as a professor, and it was not clear to me how I was going to get through my first semester, let alone understand what it was going to take to, to do this kind of innovation. Furthermore, I didn't realize at the time that I was an innovator. I didn't really understand what entrepreneurship was about or how the process went. And so through, through the first couple of years of this, uh, I, I sort of got the itch for what it meant, uh, how this could be, what could happen. And then I realized how good Carnegie Mellon and Pittsburgh were to make this happen for me and, and for the ideas that I had and for the company and the team that, that grew around it, which is an extraordinary group of people. So I just want to spend a couple minutes, I don't want to take too much time, and I don't have any slides, but I'm going to tell you just a couple things of sort of, sort of very quickly how it went. Uh, first, there was the idea. The concept was there is a need for stationary energy storage that's very cheap. It goes with renewable energy. If we don't have storage that's cheap and long life and doesn't have bad you know, environmental impact issues, then we're in trouble. Okay? And at the time, there weren't too many good options. And so I wanted to leverage the things that I knew to try and generate this. And I thought initially this would be an interesting project that I could do in a university lab that would be academically interesting and might stimulate something beyond that. Uh, but I got some really interesting results, and in 2008, I had made some contacts with some friends who were venture capitalists, and I told them, hey, this, this might really mean something. And they encouraged me not to just, just to treat it as an academic result. They encouraged me instead to treat it as something that could be an actual product, that could make a difference. And this made all the difference to, to me, because it, it changed the way I thought about innovating. It changed the way I thought about being a professor. I suddenly thought, well, why can't a professor also do this? And so I, I did. Uh, I, we set up a fund that VentureCap put some money in. Uh, Clarence Perkins, Caulfield & Byers, a prestigious West Coast venture firm. They deposited some money, and we did an incubation inside the walls of Carnegie Mellon, which uh, is not that common. But they were curious about this process as well. It was a new model. And we actually spent 18 months, uh, I was doing regular research with graduate students and postdocs. We were publishing results. We were getting past some key fundamental aspects of the technology that we had to get past before it could actually be spun out. Once that sort of, we got past that, and by the way, what we actually spun out was very dissimilar from what the initial idea was. Everything changed. We learned, we innovated, we understood how to fail fast and to move forward. Uh, it spun out in 2010. Uh, we set up shop in Lawrenceville, which is about a mile and a half, two miles from Pittsburgh, and I ride my bike every day through this dense urban area um, uh, between the two sites to, to keep sort of track of everything that's going on in both locations. Uh, we set up shop in 2010, and we grew. And the idea there is beyond the incubation, you have to get something that you will form a core team and dig in. And we had five or six people initially, and it grew to seven or eight people, and then 10 or 12 people. And we were, everyone was doing everything. We were in a tiny shop. We didn't really know what was next, uh, every, you know, sort of hand to mouth. Um, and somewhere along the line there, too, we also got a nice grant for the Department of Energy. And DOE helped us out. It was a Recovery Act uh, demonstration project. And it was a very nice piece of, uh, of money that helped us co-leverage with subsequent venture funding. And that was a major piece, too. So the story here is university, government, venture capital coming together to, to sort of around an idea and a concept and a group of people to make something happen. And after the first two or three rounds of this, this is 2011 now, we have something that's more productized. It's, it's a legitimate idea that really might be out there. Uh, of course, we can only make you know, one a day, and we need to make a million you know, a month. And so the next step is much more expensive, it requires a lot more risk, and it requires people who are willing to wait and see what will happen for five or 10 years. 
And luckily, we've been able to locate investors who are doing this. So we now uh, raise the money. And, and part of the investors include the state of Pennsylvania, by the way, who were uh, amazing in, in helping us find a home for our manufacturing facility, which is 35 miles outside the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, so we subsequently have put together um, you know, a very good team of people. And now we're about 130 some million dollars in. Uh, we're still pre-revenue, uh, but we are manufacturing now. We are producing today, right now, we're doing what's called production validation runs. Our product is coming off the line. We'll be shipping them eminently. Uh, it's extremely exciting. And the, the pathway from there uh, to here has been uh, an, out, an outrageous thing to experience. And I'm, I'm just here to tell you that it's possible. And Pittsburgh has made this happen. And I think CMU in particular is someplace that's allowed this to happen. It's been unusually supportive of entrepreneurship. And if someone like me, who has decided to, early on in their career, not be a traditionalist, to try something different. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it to uh, the next piece. Thank you, Jay. So that, that really speaks very much to the experience of being in Pittsburgh at the moment. I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Suresh uh, for, uh, for arranging this whole thing. I think it's wonderful for us to get together and uh, talk about this sort of newfound confidence that we have in Pittsburgh. Uh, my name is Andrew Moore. I used to be at uh, Carnegie Mellon University in the computer science department, uh, and since then uh, moved to Google, Google Pittsburgh. And I, I also don't have slides, and I only want to say a couple of things. I'm going to tell you about why I personally am so excited at the moment, and why Google is a very optimistic company at the moment, and why we're happy and excited. But then I'm going to reveal the big anxiety, the thing which really stresses me out at the moment. So we'll be happy for a little while, and then suddenly we're all going to get depressed together. <laughs> That's how it's going to work. All right. So I'm convinced we are at the most exciting time uh, for technology uh, in the history of the world. It is just amazing what's going on at the moment. Uh, I'm walking around. We're all walking around with supercomputers in our pockets. These supercomputers are talking to millions of super supercomputers in the clouds uh, doing amazing computations all the time. Artificial intelligence, the thing that I was dreaming about as a child, is really happening. Uh, when I look at what we were all doing on our smartphones last year, it is different and not as good as what's happening this year. And as for what's happening one year and two years from now, I, I do still get butterflies in my stomach when I think about what's happening. So the world is changing very fast, and it's really exciting at the moment. Uh, the Pittsburgh office. Uh, thanks to the existence of Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh and this sort of uh, environment that we have uh, in, uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, was an easy decision to start up. The kind of things we're doing there are a combination of uh, the more mathematical ends of computer science, where CMU excels, uh, lots of work on statistics, and machine learning and computer science. And you notice how that's three academic disciplines which have to work together and play together very well. I have people who need to know about the low level uh, kernel in an operating system and understand about the convergence of large matrix algorithms at the same time in their heads. And there are very few places you can go to get that sort of knowledge. Uh, I give you an example of a really nice thing that happens, and it's another of these kind of startup ideas that Lenore is referring to, uh, and uh, this one happened to occur inside Google rather than uh, in a cafe in Pittsburgh. Uh, we were talking about the, yeah, what's happening to retail and e-commerce, and someone mentioned the Games Unlimited store on Murray Avenue, an excellent local store which sells uh, really cool gaming stuff. And the conversation naturally came to the fact that Life is going to get really tough for small retailers uh, in the world of e-commerce. And we're talking about this and how that's a problem because these small retailers are so good for the world. And we talked about what would it take for our Games Unlimited to be able to compete with Amazon. And brainstormed, up came the concept of if only you could just say, I want this really cool thing from Games Unlimited and have it delivered to your door in the next hour. And that seemed silly at first, but then we played with the numbers and in particular, we played with the costs involved in routing uh, enough things from local stores in a city to people's houses to see if it would work out. Uh, I see Reed Simmons in the back there. Uh, probably unbeknownst to him, one of his ex-grad students had just joined Google Pittsburgh and was uh, an expert in probabilistic planning, figured out that this works. And so now, about 18 months later, we have a large and very successful pilot going on 
uh, actually, unfortunately, right now it's in the San Francisco Bay Area uh, of two-hour delivery of almost anything you want from local stores. It's uh, gaining rave reviews. People have compared it to uh, the impact of washing machines in folks' lives in that it gives a whole slew of people an extra hour in their day and is reducing uh, transportation by having stuff brought to people's houses efficiently rather than having everyone going out to buy stuff from stores. That happened as a nice, another nice little startup idea just hatched out of the community we have in Pittsburgh. So I'm happy, but I'm also anxious. And the anxiety is all to do with people. There absolutely are not enough people on the planet at the moment with the skills to take part in what's going on. Uh, and governments know this, large corporations and small businesses know this. Google certainly understands it, and that is why Google is in Pittsburgh. You can't just sit in some corporate headquarters in a place like Mountain View and hope to find the planet's best people. You come to the cities which have actually got those communities, and Pittsburgh was one of them. So that's why we're here. Uh, I'm still stressed out, though, because there still aren't enough, and uh, we need cities and the community to be developing uh, the right kind of people. So the sort of people I need are, uh, and I'll give an example, this is again a real example, someone who I can ask them, I got a matrix with a million columns and a few billion rows, and I need all its eigenvectors, and I need that person not to burst into tears. And again, really, I wouldn't come to anywhere other than Pittsburgh to find such people. So, summary, three things. Artificial intelligence is happening now. The places which build this uh, are the places which can produce creative experts, and they're the places where creative experts want to come and live. Uh, in answer to the question of how can other cities uh, model Pittsburgh's success, I'm actually pretty uh, despondent. I think that Pittsburgh, we're very lucky. We've actually got everything uh, that we need right now, uh, and we just need to push it further. Thank you very much. So, uh, these robots of our interest uh, develop the world, secure the world, uh, explore worlds beyond. Uh, we're doing very well in surgery. Robots, uh, toy robots, just can't cover the whole waterfront in a day. And uh, as a movement, it is an engine not only of the region, but uh, fueling the world. So uh, this is one that uh, in the field in implementation now um, is in the $100 billion category. So uh, uh, when beginning, there was a lot of science fiction and uh, <clears throat> a tremendous amount of fantasy and no robotics and we cut our teeth by uh, developing work machines like this and then also cleaning up the Three Mile Island nuclear accident. And one of the rest lessons there is that uh, the implementation uh, might be 100 million if the development is a million. And uh, we've kept that going on uh, uh, for the decades since. The uh, revolution, of course, has been uh, Mobility, uh, at the time, uh, machines were bolted to a factory floor and could only do what they reach. And uh, the real action is out there in the world. Uh, mining is huge in part because everything that people have or eat either comes from mining or agriculture. And uh, Pittsburgh is an immense uh, uh, mining center. Uh, there's uh, a myth in a way that it was the Iron City It's actually built on the energy of the coal from the region. There's a hundred years of it left. And it is the agenda of robotics in part because humans can't go into the abandoned mines. Um, one of my favorites of all time, uh, I'll just uh, say as I introduce it that I uh, may be the only farmer in the room that's actually uh, plowing right now. And uh, uh, 
if I weren't at a, a, a meeting in D.C., I'd be moonlighting on the tractor. But uh, that's actually old school these days, in part because of our work. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, it's actually uncommon to get high-end machines these days without uh, the GPS guidance. And these, this particular program was everything from means for guiding outdoor equipment with GPS uh, to and through the safeguarding, the ways to uh, control it. Uh, the one in the upper right, the, the one in the upper left is actually the first machine ever. We have the patents on that. And the one in the upper right is uh, a 43-year-old tractor of mine. It's the one that's plowing right now. And uh, it's got a retro kit on it. You can buy them from 30 sources. Uh, and they're better, of course, the market does a better job than we ever do in research. I'd mention air machines in part because uh, uh, our biggest contract of the week is a couple million fresh money and a new company that is uh, air logistics delivering uh, out into uh, ships at sea. And uh, you may know that one of the revolutions is the approval of uh, flying these things in several states and now wrestling with the policy issues of uh, what about uh, air vehicles in our midst. Uh, something in the news is uh, seeking airplanes underwater. It's old, old school to us. That turns out to be the Dornier, the last of the Dorniers from the Second World War. And uh, even in Washington, you may uh, I recognize the uh, oil leak, and that manipulator is the derivative of the craft manipulator from the first of our nuclear machines. The, uh, it's not all high tech. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the namesake companies and one of the uh, ones that's been around is just sewer service. So everybody flushes the toilet, you expect it to work. Uh, this is a Pittsburgh company. You uh, used to put people down in there. Now you just drop a machine and you can pick it up somewhere else in town. Uh, that, uh, uh, that's evolving now from the, uh, eval uh, just the uh, inspections into uh, repair of the infrastructure. And it doesn't displace people in part because humans just can't get into 20 inches pipe. Uh, I mentioned the uh, revolution of driving, uh, and <clears throat> one of the robots in the corner is uh, 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 developed in the context of a challenge. Robotics has uh, more challenges than uh, any emerging discipline, and uh, beyond the region's portfolio of contracts, products, enterprise, research, grants, uh, we also engage in the challenges that are worth it. And these, the real good, the great ones, um, transform the world. They uh, change belief. Uh, that uh, uh, Lindbergh's or Tig Prize may be the most familiar, but in the context of these chats, uh, what matters to here is that uh, the outcome of it is something called the Lindbergh boom where that industry then goes on to have uh, years and years of uh, growth and uh, innovation and uh, enterprise. And of course, uh, uh, the races that, uh, uh, these car races uh, had that effect uh, and are having that effect. That's another one which is uh, uh, well over billions in the short years. Uh, and it's also the largest of the markets for automation. Uh, we, uh, uh, it's never about the money, but of course, uh, when they give you a prize check, uh, you, uh, you cash it. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the other is that uh, halo effect with the allies and partners. So uh, uh, one outcome of this was to bring our major sponsors to town for the same reasons that were mentioned. Uh, the critical mass and the ability to do things in the city that you may not do in the quad cities or in Peoria. Um, one that 
is up at this time is the largest challenge in all history. Pretty straightforward, they all are. Uh, it's uh, a $20 million prize uh, for landing on the moon, driving a few hundred meters. Uh, we'll win that. <clears throat> the other, of course, is that we uh, start with a company and uh, it's pretty straightforward. You may know that uh, launch services are privatized and um, that's the way we're going. Uh, and then um, developing the robot, uh, the lander, which is itself a, uh, a, a technically rich robot. And then from that, the driving machine that will uh, clinch the 500 meters. The uh, uh, companies uh, um, established in high growth hiring uh, all aspects of this are hiring. I mentioned it's not about the money, but uh, just to give you a sense of the scale, it's a come from nowhere activity, meaning the first ever uh, robotics initiative and uh, the integration under the curve of revenue uh, just banked its billionth dollar within the university. And then with our allies, uh, we're well, well over uh, 10 billion and then in those implementations in the world uh, with farming, mining, uh, and uh, defense and the like, uh, well over 100 million, billion. Uh, something that the, the three of us have in common, it was cool, everybody, each person mentioned it. Uh, so uh, uh, Google is set up in one of the coolest old buildings, it's the Nabisco Bakery, and uh, that uh, uh, Jay mentioned Lawrenceville, which is uh, one of the neighborhoods that robotics has transformed. So we actually went into it when it was a slum, uh, picked up an amazing great building like you can get in Pittsburgh's an old, old mill, and it's filled to the brim with everything you'd want. And uh, from that, all the spill off of uh, restaurants popping up and everybody buying the homes and upscale and the like. And uh, I put this up because it's the uh, fourth neighborhood that I've been run out of by the places going upscale. And these are actual, <laughs> these are actual pictures of, uh, the one on the lower left is the, uh, the south side when I came to town. And uh, geez, you know, now you drive your boat up to the dock and order a drink and it's just, <laughs> There's, 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 it's, it's just been ruined. Uh, and the, the one up on top is um, very close to my heart because it's the last of the active mills inside Pittsburgh. And it's uh, now being uh, completely transformed. Our nickname for it is Robot City. Um, in some circles, uh, a nickname for Pittsburgh is Roboburg. And um, it's uh, on that site that we're bringing up a lot of robotic activity now. And then lastly, um, it's just one of the cool buildings. I've had the pleasure of having a lot of them over time. And this one uh, was uh, the original building where George Westinghouse, who's another Pittsburgh tech character, uh, uh, built his empire. and. Uh, that's the location that uh, Astrobotic just picked up, this space company just picked up to uh, make the stand. Anyway, uh, I uh, can't imagine another uh, institution than Carnegie Mellon where I would have gotten away with what I got away with in this life. And, uh, uh, you know, the story of whether robotics might have happened elsewhere uh, is too long for right now, but doesn't matter because that's where it happened. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Luke Skirman. I'm the CEO of Niche.com. I'm also on the board of trustees of Carnegie Mellon. I'm also the chairman of Thrill Mill. I uh, want to tell you about my entrepreneurial journey over the last 12 years in a couple of minutes, and then I want to introduce some of our guests uh, who are going to provide some context from a national perspective. <clears throat> So I was born in Manhattan, I grew up in San Francisco, and when I was in high school, I was absolutely obsessed with trying to choose the right college, just became obsessed with it. Uh, I read US News and World Reports, read Princeton Review, did all these things, and for me, the missing component 
was the student's voice. That's what I really wanted to know. I wanted to know, do I join a fraternity? Is the food good? Was the dorms good? Do I bring a laptop? All these little things were missing for me. And at the height of my sophomore year in college, 1999, 2000, all these companies were starting. The first internet boom was starting. And I wanted to start a company. I came to Carnegie Mellon because I loved the campus. It was this campus right in the middle of Pittsburgh. And I just felt right. It was breathable, it was livable, it was affordable. And it was this great East Coast experience. I got to study business right as a freshman, and I loved it. I thought I was going to go into finance, but finance was, was not that fun. Entrepreneurship was, was really fun, building things, doing a little bit of marketing, a little bit of management, a little bit of everything. So the company, it started off, the name was College Prowler, and we first started selling books, one book on one college. And we sold 500,000 books, millions of dollars of revenue, distribution across the country. But we started to realize that the users, our students, wanted this information online. So we digitized the content. We began selling subscription access, like a wallstreetjournal.com. That was from 2007 to 2009. But, but people, students, and families expected the content to be free. So finally, 2009, we open up the content. We make it free. And the traffic starts soaring. So last year, about 30% uh, of all high school graduates in the United States created a College Prowler account on our website. So we're just a little bit smaller than the SAT and the ACT, uh, with a very small staff right in Pittsburgh. So as a guy that was born in Manhattan, grew up in San Francisco, I never thought I would stay in Pittsburgh, but I met these incredible investors, raised $1.3 million by the time I was 24 years old, and Pittsburgh just kept opening up doors for me. Doors just kept opening, kept meeting these great people, and all this momentum kept happening. And what Lenore is doing with Project Olympus and other things going on in Pittsburgh, and Alpha Lab, Alpha Lab Gear, the entrepreneurial climate in Pittsburgh is accelerating now. It's never been stronger right now. Um, and I wanted to personally be part of that and accelerate it and make it even further. Um, my company kept growing and we started to think, how can we get bigger? So we rebranded the company last year as Niche. My favorite definition of Niche from Merriam-Webster is a person, place, employment, or status for which a person or thing is best fitted. We want to help people make great life decisions. So we help them choose the right college. Now we started to help them choose the right school. So we now have coverage on all 120,000 K through 12 schools in the United States. We just launched Niche Local. That's coverage on every city and neighborhood in the United States. So that's Georgetown versus Adams Morgan. That's Alexandria versus Arlington. And it's growing really rapidly right now. Um, just to give one quick slide on, on our content. So it took a long time to get the content model right. Um, but we're now at about 35 million reviews and opinions. We're gonna finish the year at about 60 million reviews. We're just like a hair smaller with a very small company at, compared to billion dollar publicly traded companies like the Yelps and the Trip Advisors of the world. And we're doing this right here in Pittsburgh, right in Shadyside, about a mile from Carnegie Mellon. Um, and what's happened with Pittsburgh has just, it's so cool. When I, when I graduated, nobody wanted to stay in Pittsburgh. Everyone wanted to go to the New York, DC, Philadelphia, San Francisco, Chicago. And now people want to stay in Pittsburgh. It's affordable, it's a high quality of life. There's cool things happening, there's buzz right now, and it's never been better. And I created a side project that turned into a nonprofit called Thrill Mill. Um, so I'm the chairman of the board, and it's a nonprofit all about entrepreneurship. So in 18 months, we have raised $1.8 million. Um, and what we do is we give very small investments to very early stage companies. And what we try to do is let's retain these awesome people in Pittsburgh and keep them right here. From University of Pittsburgh, from Carnegie Mellon, from Duquesne, from Robert Morris, all these brilliant minds, let's not let them go to Silicon Valley. Let's keep them right here in Pittsburgh and we'll give them free office space for an entire year. Last year we had 14 companies go through the program. This year we had 15, we had over 100 applicants uh, this year, really intensive educational programming, mentorship, and then we kick it off in September at what we call Thrival. It stands for Pittsburgh's Thriving and Reviving right now. 
and that will be on September 13th and 14th at Bakery Square 1 and 2, right where Google Pittsburgh is. And we're expecting 5,000 people on Saturday and Sunday on September 13th and 14th. And the business plan competition that we started this all is called the Business Bout. Um, Thrill Mill has a lot of momentum. My company, Niche, tons of momentum. I've, we just recruited people from Arlington, Virginia, and from Boston in the last week to join my company. Pittsburgh is, is doing great right now, um, and Carnegie Mellon is a central driver for that. It's just unbelievable to have such a world-class university in the backyard making the city so much better. Um, so I'm so thankful to be here today, and I, I'd like to now introduce two of our guests. Um, on the far left is Martin Abraham, who is the dean of the College of Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics at Youngstown State. He has uh, been working extremely closely with manufacturing companies in the region. And then who I'm going to have come up right now is Nish Achara, who is currently a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, who during his, who during his service at the Department of Commerce has studied the impact of universities on regional economies across the country. Nish? Uh, thank you, Dr. Suresh, for inviting me here today. I just want to mention that actually, uh, Dr. Suresh, when I was in the Obama administration and when he was at NSF, uh, actually launched a program called i which I think uh, when uh, the Obama administration term is over is going to be recognized as one of the most uh, innovative programs started. It certainly really boosted the whole idea of commercialization and economic development uh, from, uh, research, from the research community around the country. Uh, and at the Commerce Department, we copied it from an institutional perspective uh, with something called the I-6 challenge. So you have to have the I in there. We took I-6, i core came out of NSF. Uh, so thank you for that. I also want to add that one of my other colleagues, Dr. Uh, Pat Gallagher, will be joining you in Pittsburgh as, as the new head of the University of Pittsburgh. And I think that in itself talks a little bit about the Pittsburgh model, that uh, you bring in two leaders who have a clear interest in innovation, uh, in research, and the role it plays in the development of a region. Uh, and so as we talk about the Pittsburgh model and what this all means, I, I think the, uh, leadership, as I'll mention later, is a, is a critical part of that. So, when we think about what's going on in Pittsburgh versus what's going on in the rest of the country, um, I, I, it's kind of interesting because I think if you come here tomorrow to this room, there might be another state here with another set of universities with a whole similar set of slides. And one of the challenges we have in terms of developing models is to really be able to separate out the, uh, the regions that say they spun off 20 companies, which just may be ideas that set up an LLC, versus those that are really getting funded, those are really uh, filing patents, and those are able to get venture capital backing, grow, what have you. And Pittsburgh, I think, uh, once you clear through the noise, clearly as a region uh, is there. Um, and I think we're already seeing a lot of other regions, uh, particularly I've seen it in, in, uh, in, in New Orleans and in New Mexico uh, and other places, look at Pittsburgh and say, this is the slow and steady uh, sort of path we need to take in investment over time, in the infrastructure, in the research, uh, in the ecosystem, uh, so that we can get to a place of regular uh, startup creation uh, and the recruitment of big companies like Google uh, that really have their choice of places in the world to find innovation and entrepreneurship. So I think that's the first thing, is that this is going on nationally, and we're already seeing a replication of the Pittsburgh model by universities wherever they can. Uh, but, the, but the reality of the accomplishments in Pittsburgh are much greater. I think the other area where Pittsburgh has differentiated itself is in the creation of the uh, entrepreneurial eco ecosystem itself. So Luke touched upon that a little bit. Uh, when I was at Commerce, the first uh, I-6 Challenge grant winner we, we had was actually Innovation Works uh, and Carnegie Mellon. And one of the reasons it was given to the region was their ability uh, to connect the dots between the universities, between the entrepreneurs, the investors, and essentially lay out ideas and innovation to the uh, investor community up front and to the, some of the large companies in the area to figure out how to commercialize, what's the business model, what's the pathway to follow. Uh, and so I think uh, the existence of Innovation Works, of the Carnegie Mellon Center for Entrepreneurship, of similar centers at the other universities, of groups like the Indus Entrepreneurs, which now has its fifth largest chapter in the country in, uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, and also of all the other activities, the abundance of startup weekends, of accelerators uh, that, are, that are under discussion or have launched. Uh, this is where the Pittsburgh region is differentiating itself 
from a lot of other uh, cities and universities where there's a lot of activity on campus, but no connection that's very strong uh, once they leave campus. And so uh, while that's strong, I think that's also the area where uh, the region needs to continue to invest. Uh, you know, just as a data point, last week, uh, Mass Challenge, which is our uh, Uber incubator in the Boston area, got 1,600 applications uh, for its six-month accelerator. So if Pittsburgh's shooting for uh, the creation of a startup community uh, with the desires, uh, you know, if it desires to be Boston and Austin in that level, that's sort of the, the point you want to get to. 1,600 startups interested in coming in. And I think that's a good goal, and I think it's an attainable goal with the level of talent, innovation, and research that's there. Finally, I'll say the, the there's three characteristics, I think, uh, that I've seen in Pittsburgh, and I'm starting to see in other cities, uh, particularly out of the coast, uh, that are important to look at. Uh, the first, and this cannot be understated again, is, is leadership. I think uh, what we've seen in Pittsburgh from the political and civic leadership, from the business leadership, uh, and from the university leadership is, is a, a sense that we need to create our own uh, innovation, we need to create our own economy, uh, that nobody's necessarily gonna move in and, and build a factory with 3,000 new jobs, although some of the initiatives at Youngstown uh, and in the region uh, might be able to do that. Uh, so that's one thing, is that sort of common civic leadership in a sense that we need to invest in the institutions uh, that will create jobs locally. Uh, the second one is the broad base, broad utilization of existing assets in order to do that. So obviously we're here talking about Carnegie Mellon, uh, we're talking about University of Pittsburgh a little bit, but the uh, foundation community uh, in Pittsburgh, and, the, and people know the story of what they did with the public schools, but what that has fostered uh, more than that is a culture of innovation that goes across sectors. So it's not really just about robotics. It's about innovation in education. It's about innovation in health. It's about innovation in the nonprofit sector. And that same environment of innovation, uh, the more you grow it, the more you'll see startups, whether they're for-profit or non-profit, you'll start to see that same level of excitement and entrepreneurship. Uh, and I think the, the philanthropic community, the state, uh, through funding programs like uh, Innovation Works and others, has helped facilitate that. And the third, and this is sort of a, a result of this, is, as I mentioned, the volume of activity going on in Pittsburgh. It's uh, certainly got more startups uh, than most cities now, certainly outside of the two coasts, uh, but it's also got uh, one of the larger population of new nonprofits uh, as well that are looking at new solutions for age-old problems that we have in society. And again, I believe that those two go hand in hand, uh, and it's not just about commercialization from the lab, but about a culture of solving problems and rolling up your sleeves, and, and I think what some of the speakers have said sort of goes with that uh, hand in hand. Um, so in closing, I think I'll just mention that uh, I've seen this in two other places now around the country, uh, and that's in New Mexico, where the state is really involved with the two research labs, Sandia and Los Alamos, and looking at how to leverage uh, the, the research there to build their local regional ecosystem. Uh, and they have often talked about Pittsburgh and the model there. And then in New Orleans, where there's now 500 startups, and they've also talked about the need for local ownership of their economy, local leadership, uh, and how do you create a culture where you don't just have a few startups coming out of the best labs, but you have a constant steady stream of good ideas uh, and entrepreneurs who are committed to the region uh, and are committed to sort of the future as it is. So uh, I think the, the Pittsburgh model is, is, uh, uh, is uh, one that's exciting to, uh, uh, to see grow and succeed. And I think with uh, Dr. Suresh and uh, Dr. Gallagher, uh, you're all in good hands on the academic side. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to apologize a little bit for you for my voice. I'm still trying to get over a cold, and uh, I'm going to try to make it through. I've got a uh, few comments I want to make about uh, what we're doing in Youngstown. And as I'm listening to the presentations, I'm discovering that what you've done in Pittsburgh and what we're thinking of doing in Youngstown, or trying to do in Youngstown, very similar, very related, a lot of commonality. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of commonality of activity. One of the things that we did about six or seven years ago was created a college of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And that allowed us to work very collaboratively across disciplines to not only create new knowledge, but then to work with the engineering folks to develop that new knowledge. As a result, the university fully integrated into the resurgence of the city and into the community. We became the model 
for collaboration in research, in development, and education. And our graduates are there, are there, are there, are there, are there um, driving economic development through innovation and through, through research. So, as has been said before, a large challenge here is to get the right people, to put them in place, to bring the groups together, to get creative faculty to lead the way in innovation curriculum so we can educate the next generation, and to build the economic engagement getting the companies together with the uh, faculty. Uh, a little bit about keys, keys to success. One of the things that we found particularly useful is an applied focus. Not only why do you do things, but how do you do things. Getting our students to understand how they get engaged, how things work, how to develop the next things going forward. A lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of laboratory experiences, a lot of project-based activities, a lot of experiential education, connecting our students with the businesses, with the community, real-world engineering experience, supporting economic growth in the community, building partnerships with businesses. I really apologize. We've really, growth, seen a lot of growth in getting our students out in the community, not just locally, but nationally. A lot of integration, a lot of outreach, working with the companies. We've built what we consider to be a partnership continuum. It's all about growing trust and growing relationships. One of the things that differentiates Youngstown from what we've talked about before is we've worked a lot with existing companies not so much necessarily building new companies, but working with existing companies to enable them to grow new ideas that we can help them develop. So, moving together, working with our faculty to help the companies solve problems, growing along this, what we call the partnership continuum, moving from talking to companies to putting students to work in companies and then to building relationships and growth of research and activities. And I would say as you're building out from Pittsburgh, look to Youngstown, because we got students who can work at Google, and we got students who can work with your startups and your companies, and they'd be happy to move down to Pittsburgh and grow that relationship. We're only 60 miles apart. We'd love to build a better relationship and more opportunities. We do this work together on a variety of mechanisms, a variety of activities in the workforce area. It's all about building a relationship from the educational organizations, the career and tech centers, the high schools, the community college. We've got a, a world-class children's science center that's been created in the last four or five years, downtown Youngstown. And I was reminded of the conversation around place, building a cohesive place. Downtown Youngstown and the university creates about a half a mile square district in the city where everything is coming together. It's the Children's Center, it's the community college, it's the university, it's America Makes, the new National Center for Additive Manufacturing located in downtown Youngstown. The Youngstown Business Incubator located a thousand steps from the university. All of the communities in the city working together to build the region, to reinvigorate the restaurants, places to go. People want to have a place to meet over a cup of coffee and putting it together in the Youngstown area. And we've seen that growth down in the city of Youngstown. Our niche really is putting it all together from molecules to manufacturing, understanding how to make a material and then how to use that material. A whole host of things that we've achieved that we like to talk about, not unlike what you talk about in Pittsburgh, number one in Ohio and number 25th nationally, bang for the buck community. The YBI is the 11th best inc university affiliated incubator in the world. Workforce development expertise, partnerships between the university 
and the community and the incubator, the elected officials pulling it together, leveraging the assets to create a world-class opportunity in a small community. You don't need to be on the coasts to be creating new technology anymore. You can do it anywhere, and you can do it cheaper in Youngstown because rent is cheap. Workforce people, they'll work for less. They're no worse. They're just as good as everybody else, but they'll work a little less expensively because it doesn't cost as much to live there. And by the way, it's an hour drive to Pittsburgh to be, the re to be related and to take advantage of all the resources Pittsburgh has. Our college has had a huge impact in our region, working with the companies, growing relationships with all of the businesses, some local, some nationally, some based in Youngstown, some based in Pittsburgh. The STEM education opportunities, um, collaboration with universities, federal state initiatives, all of the federal programs that provide opportunities for our students and our faculty, National Science Foundation's great programs that Dr. Suresh has, has developed over time, the work in NASA, SBIR programs for our small businesses, working with the investors, the entrepreneurs, all of these capabilities. It's been a great time to be in Youngstown because we've been able to bring a lot of these capabilities together. And we've modeled a lot on some of the successes in Pittsburgh, and we're working with Pittsburgh. We're putting together a proposal now, collaboratively with Pittsburgh, to be designated as a manufacturing community. We think we've got a great opportunity because Pittsburgh's doing great things and Youngstown's doing great things, 60 miles apart, doing great things together, we hope. So that's our story in Youngstown, and I think we've got a really, we're, we're a little bit behind Pittsburgh, we're a little smaller than Pittsburgh, but we're doing a lot of the same things and having a lot of the same success. So with that, I thank you, and I appreciate your patience with my lack of voice. Uh, Nish and Martin, thank you so much for uh, the great remarks. I think Pittsburgh is looking forward to getting to where Boston and Austin are, and we look forward to working more closely with Youngstown. It sounds like you're doing some great things. Um, we are going to do some Q&A, but first, um, I do want to introduce a very special guest. Uh, we have a congressman, Mike Doyle, who's been a f fantastic friend of Carnegie Mellon for a very long time. I'd uh, love for you to come up and say a few words. Well, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure here, and I want to thank Senator Casey and Senator Toomey for providing me an entry visa over here to the U.S. Senate, <laughs> or as we refer to it over in the House, the House of Lords. Uh, it's good to be here, and it's uh, good to be here with so many familiar faces. Uh, Subra, uh, welcome. We're glad to have you down here in Washington, D.C., and, and uh, to talk about a subject that's near and dear to my heart, the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, I've worked collaboratively with many of the people you see up here on the stage. Uh, I knew Red Whitaker when he had red hair. And, uh, and Andy, it's good to see you. Uh, Google Pittsburgh is just doing some amazing things, and to see the growth uh, across the street, there's a a brand new building going up pretty quickly that uh, they're going to occupy a lot of that space. So uh, uh, just, just good to be here and, and talk about Pittsburgh and what's been going on. You know, I, I've, I've lived in Pittsburgh my entire life. Uh, my grandfather in the early 1900s come over from Ireland and, and Pittsburgh's where they landed. And back then the Irish could get jobs in the mill. So they, my family were all steel mill workers. My grandfather worked at the Cary Furnace in Rankin and my father worked at Edgar Thompson Steel Mill in Braddock. And I worked two summers in the mill and decided I wanted to go to college. Uh, <laughs> that's tough work there. But uh, I think those of us that have lived in, in Pittsburgh all our lives, uh, when we saw what was going on in the 70s and 80s, we realized that uh, we could no longer be a one-horse town, that we still do a lot of manufacturing in Pittsburgh, but it started to become clear uh, to a lot of us in the region that uh, manufacturing alone wasn't going to be able to sustain and, and produce a, a, a robust economy in Pittsburgh. And I think that's why a lot of us came to the conclusion that we had to build a more diverse economy around the greatest assets that we still had, our, our human capital, and most notably uh, concentrated in, in a lot of our highly respected research universities, uh, Carnegie and Mellon and, and Pitt among them. 
And the efforts took many forms, but speaking from the congressional delegation, uh, we worked as a team uh, in both parties to increase federal funding for research uh, in the aggregate, but also in specific areas like robotics and healthcare, where we felt that our local research community already possessed significant expertise and would be very uh, successful at, at, at uh, competing for grants, and they were. Um, in addition, we, we worked to secure federal seed money uh, for important local initiatives in the areas. Uh, the National Robotics Engineering Center, SciLab, the Pittsburgh Life Sciences Greenhouse, the McGowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine, uh, the Nanomaterials Commercialization Center. Uh, we provided essential support for the Pittsburgh supercomputer when it was needed. Uh, and we worked hard to clean up some of these old industrial sites to prepare them for, for new businesses. And we didn't ignore our human capital either. We worked to promote entrepreneurship and facilitate the commercialization of spin-offs from our local universities. Carnegie Mellon, I think, recognized this early on, and uh, they recognized the many challenges inherent in developing a successful business venture from research results, and they established the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship to help faculty and students through that process very successfully. And uh, currently, as we speak today, we're in the process of transforming what used to be the old Conley Vocational Tech School. Uh, back then, this was a school that, that taught kids that weren't going to college uh, the trades, to become carpenters and plumbers and electricians. Uh, now we've worked with the local universities, with the nonprofit communities, with our foundations, uh, state and local governments to transform that old vocational school into a small business in incubator, a research facility, and a job training center that's fo focused on green energy technologies. And in addition, we've worked to improve our local infrastructure and our recreational opportunities because we, we knew it was important to improve the quality of life in Pittsburgh. And uh, many people that haven't been to our city at all or haven't been there for many, many years uh, still somewhat think it has a reputation of this smoky old dirty city. Uh, but those of you who know Pittsburgh today and to see the changes in our rivers and the development that's taking uh, place along the riverbanks, uh, realize that, that we've created a climate and an atmosphere there that's attractive uh, to people. People uh, want a good quality of life where they work. Uh, I think it's, you know, I, I hear stories a lot from some of the people that moved to Google, uh, to Pittsburgh from outside. Uh, just, just remark about number one, how big of a house you could buy in Pittsburgh. <laughs> compared to the West Coast. Uh, and then all the other amenities are there. It, it, it's got a big town culture in a small town city. And, and I think that's attractive because people want to, uh, you know, raise their families and, and live in an area where they have all this. So I, I think those efforts have helped our high tech sector grow. And the bottom line is I think you have to start with a critical mass of cutting edge research in one or more areas of expertise. And from a national policy point of view, I'd argue that the biggest lesson to draw from Pittsburgh's renaissance is that now more than ever, economic growth is driven by technological change. And the best way to promote more rapid, rapid economical growth in the country is for the federal government to invest more in research so that we can maintain America's leadership in innovation. Today, I know you've heard from a number of distinguished speakers and panelists about how research universities can drive economic growth. Uh, I'm proud that many of them consider Pittsburgh their home. I hope this uh, symposium today will prove instructive for other regions around the nation that are looking to reinvent themselves. Uh, I think Pittsburgh truly is a model worth emulating, and uh, it's great to be here at the symposium today, and I look forward to having a cocktail with you. Thank you. Congre Congressman Doyle, thank you so much for those great words. Um, we're going to try to keep this to the 6 o'clock as best as we can, so I'd like to uh, now introduce Dr. Randy Bryant, uh, University Professor and Dean of the School of Computer Science, for our closing remarks right now. Thank you very much, Luke, and I realize that I'm between you and a lot of interesting activities, so I'll keep my remarks short. But um, let me point out that there's sort of two parts in which the university plays a major role in regional economic development. The first is in our sort of becoming actively involved in the innovation and entrepreneur cycle. And uh, if I look at, say, how it was when I first started as a faculty member many years ago, we viewed our job as just to do pure basic science, create research, and it was the job of companies such as IBM and other big companies to take those and turn them into commercial products. 
But now that we're actively involved in having projects such as Project Olympus within our university, we actually create in there an interesting innovation cycle where we do basic research, but we also get involved in the, the commercialization of that technology, which of course in itself stimulates new research problems that we have to solve to actually make things work, and that uh, continues this cycle of innovation. And that also begins to have major impact on the economy of our region. If you think again back at the old model where we just took in government money, did research, and that was that, CMU had relatively little impact on the Pittsburgh economy. Uh, the other aspect of a course is talent. So if I look at Carnegie Mellon across our multiple programs that are sort of computer science, computer engineering, and related fields, we generate about 1,000 graduates per year. Uh, in computer science, at least, we still are mostly sending them off to one of the two coasts. So for example, among our alumni, our 7,500 alumni from the school, uh, about 1,600 of them are in the Bay Area, and 800 of them are in the Pittsburgh area. So two to one factor. Uh, the next uh, regions, by the way, are, are less than that, so we are in the number two spot. But that's also, uh, in many ways, a great opportunity. If we can just capture a little bit more of that talent, that will uh, also have great impact. And of course, it's a, a cycle that needs to develop. You have to have great jobs for these people to want to stay in Pittsburgh. But when they do, that builds up the economy, which stimulates new opportunities. So I'm very optimistic. I think we've heard a lot of stories here today about how that's happening. And I'll also point out that we have demonstrations around here where you have an opportunity to see some really interesting work that also highlights this idea of this innovation economy and, and what impact it can have in the region. So you'll see uh, several different uh, student-developed companies. One is Elijah Mayfield of Lightside Labs, creating an educational technology that grew out of his doctoral work in language technologies. Uh, Justin Sabo of Digital Dream Labs developed a project uh, that involves physical tiles connected to a video game so that children can program it uh, with their hand by physically manipulating objects. Uh, Hannah Alexander is the founder of Soul Power, a portable power source for your cell phone. And uh, uh, also several projects that are at CMU uh, involving robotics. So one is CHIMP, which is a humanoid robot, uh, part of a, a DARPA challenge in emergency rescue teams. A Victor, which has become uh, reputed to be the best uh, smack-talking uh, but lousy Scrabble program uh, robot in the world. And then Finch, which is uh, an educational robot and also CMU spin-off, which is uh, available for children in uh, uh, middle school and primary school to be able to learn the basics of robotics. So thank you all for coming. And I encourage you to uh, talk with one another and enjoy these uh, displays and, of course, the refreshments we have. Thank you very much.